All right, so um, I'm going to apologize. My voice is a little weak today, so um, if you could uh, keep, keep, the vol keep your own volume down a little because I'm not going to be able to project quite as well. Um, okay, so over the last few days we've been talking about optimization and various techniques for uh, improving the performance of a query. Uh, today we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to start uh, talking about estimating the cost of a particular plan. And this is going to be the first step towards uh, doing cost-based optimization. So I'm going to give you a little idea of how to estimate costs, uh, specifically for uh, scans and largely for join free queries, but we'll, we'll try and cover a little bit of, bit of that towards the end. And uh, we're going to talk about how that fits into uh, the grander scheme of things, how that fits into a, a big uh, query optimizer. Uh, but before I get into that, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, first off, um, I sent an email to the list. Um, the Project One deadline has been extended to Tuesday night. But uh, for those of you who have already submitted, uh, congratulations, you have earned 20 bonus points. Uh, Project Two will be assigned on Wednesday. Uh, the general structure of that is going to be uh, you're going to build uh, two or three. Uh, there will be two. Um, you'll be asked to build a hash index, an ISAM tree index, and uh, as an optional sort of extra credit, uh, you'll also be able to, uh, you'll also have the option of building a dynamic version of either. That is to say, B plus tree uh, and or a one of the two remaining index types, uh, the two types of um, linear or extendable hash. Um, also, homework four is going to be assigned, uh, is going to be posted a bit later today, and that will be due um, on um, Monday morning, Sunday night, depending on how, what, how you want to look at it. So basically one week from now. Um, any questions? Sorry? Um, it will probably be due um, on the order of three or four weeks. So you'll have about three or four weeks to do it. All right, anything else? All right, so the big question today, how do you pick the right way of executing a query? So if you recall, on Friday, we talked about relational algebra equivalencies. Uh, in other words, if you take uh, two different, uh, you can have two different relational algebra expressions that represent essentially the same query, represent the same question. And you can transform between these. They're uh, according to a couple of rules. So we've essentially addressed this first question that we've been asking so far. Uh, how do you identify uh, an algorithm that could be equivalent, uh, a, a, a query that is equivalent, or a way of uh, computing the query that is equivalent? And now we're going to uh, start talking about how, uh, how do we make that choice. Um, so. Uh, essentially, we have this whole space of possible uh, relational algebra expressions that we could use to evaluate our query. And each of them corresponds to a different way of uh, processing the, the query. And how do we pick which one of those is uh, the best? And so uh, to, start, to start this uh, question off and to wake you guys up a little bit, uh, everyone turn to your neighbor. And here is a big ass query. Um, I'd like you to do two things. Uh, first off, um, ask your, well, actually, uh, sorry. Um, so first off, uh, just as, as uh, the overall class, um, what, it, what, exa uh, what exactly is this query asking? So. OK, the number of officers in a specific rank, uh, but there's also a, uh, so that covers that. And, but that doesn't cover this or this. Officers having come the age of twenty. Okay, so officers in their twenties um, who have a rank higher than two. Uh, and what's this doing? So two. Uh, yes. So two officers uh, of that rank are on the same. Uh, sorry, there are two different ships of officers with that particular rank. In other words, uh, you first compute 
Yeah. So uh, for any given rank, there are at least two office, uh, two different ships with officers uh, of that rank. Okay. So um, if you turn to your uh, to your neighbors, uh, can you give me turn to your neighbors and uh, try and work out maybe a very naive uh, or you know, make it as complex as you like. But just using the scan, select, project, and aggregate operators, how would you evaluate this query uh, in, as a relational algebra expression? Maybe having a little bit of trouble figuring out how the having uh, works into all of this. Try this. This is an equivalent query, and if you you'll note, uh, the having is essentially a post-processing step. So I pulled out the having clause and moved that into a where clause in the select statement uh, around the same query as before. So this might be a little bit. Uh, more streamlined. Quick show of hands, uh, who thinks they're ready? Who needs? Okay, a little more time.
Alrighty, so uh, let's let's start this off. So where where does the let's let's do this as a, a relational algebra query plan. So the the sort of uh, tree structure that we've been using uh, before, and this is essentially equivalent to a generic relational algebra expression. So uh, how are, how are we going to start that off? Scan over scan. Okay. So scan over officers, then. Okay. Okay. Select of rank and age. And aggregate. And, hmm? and then a projection. And uh, another projection. Select. Okay. Okay. So I haven't actually given you uh, much in the way of schema either, but essentially, yeah, there will also be. Uh, so select on uh, D sheet. Okay. Um, now we've talked about a number of different equivalencies uh, in expressions like this. We can move some of these expressions up and down. But we can also merge different operators together. So we've talked about building, building indices. So one of the things we're going to explore today is essentially how to um, exploit the, the fact that we have a selection predicate right next to a uh, table scan, or the fact that we can take a selection predicate and we can move it all the way down to a table scan. Um, Out of curiosity, is it possible to take this uh, selection predicate and move it up here? Uh, this entire selection predicate and move it up here? Yes, or... What, um, so, what is, what is essentially the schema going to be after this aggregate operation? Sorry? Rank, count, and, and, and well, yeah, and the other count. Um, what about age? Age would be lost. So we can't move the entire thing, but we can, uh, but we can still move the uh, the the rank half of this. So uh, recall from last time, uh, this is equivalent to select on rank and select on age because we can split apart selections on ends. And that will come up again in a moment. But for now. OK. So the, the point of this exercise is to get you, uh, to, get you to note that, this, that if we have a selection predicate around a table scan, uh, if you'll, and if you'll recall, uh, Last week we talked about, or last week we talked about this a couple of times. If you have a selection predicate around uh, a table scan. You can merge those together to get an index scan, and that's pretty much going to be our, our main topic for today. Um, so how do we how do we sort of figure out um, how to uh, how to exploit that? Um, so essentially, we we end up having two questions that we need to be able to ask. Uh, Let me back up a little bit. Um, so there are a number of different uh, possible queries that we could execute. Um, and in addition, for, for each of these uh, predicates, 
There are a number of different ways of, of rewriting even those predicates. Um, where did I put that chuck? So you can take, uh, for example, this aggregate operation and think back to uh, a week or two uh, ago. How, how can we implement an aggregate operation? What, what are the, the two ways that, that you implement that you can use to implement an aggregate? Sequential read on a tree index. Uh, so if you have uh, said it again? Perform a sequential read on a tree index. Well, perform a sequential uh, read on a well. So any any sort of sorted. Uh, if if your data set is sorted, then you can uh, then you can perform that aggregate uh, pretty efficiently. How? It is sequential, so we can get the index, the like the starting index and the ending index. Well, okay. So, um, I see. Um, no. So the, the the aggregate operation needs to, uh, I should say, the group by aggregate operation uh, needs to do this this grouping step, right? So it needs to take uh, take rows with the same keys and it needs to group them together. So what are what are the two strategies that you can do for, for that you can use uh, to to do the grouping? So you can sort, and that gives you uh, all of your, your values in adjacent uh, positions. Or hash. Right. So already we have two different possibilities for implementing this, this query plan. Uh, now we have a second question, uh, which is, so we can merge these two, uh, or these, uh, two selection predicates uh, with our table scan, and we can do a couple of different types of scans. We can uh, either just do the raw scan and perform the selection on top of it. Uh, we can use some sort of index that's uh, over age. We can use some sort of index over rank. Maybe we have an index on both. Um, which of those is the best idea? Um, which of those is the best thing that we could possibly do? And. More generally, let's say we have one index on age and one index on rank. Which one of those should we use? And so we have this whole space of, of possible plans that we can use. And each of them is... Uh, and that space is generated basically by two questions. First, how do we, how do we read in the data? And how do we implement uh, operations like group by aggregates? How do we, uh, what, what algorithm do we use for each of those? Um, so basically, up, up to this point, uh, are, there, are there any questions up to this point? Yes? I have a question related to group by, which has to be done in the project. OK. Uh, so can we have, uh, on the same relation, a group by statement on two columns? Yes. It's entirely possible to do, uh, if I wanted to do group by... So just like uh, you can build an index on multiple keys, you can group on multiple keys. And in that case, each group is defined by distinct values in both columns. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Anything else? Yes. OK. Um, the, the and part of expression. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, is that supposed to be only the green? Because there is uh, like yes. and something. So, mm -hmm. uh, are those, the, those are two conditions for the join, right? You can. Uh, yes, yeah, so essentially, uh, you, you could take those selection, selection predicates and break them apart if you wanted to. Uh, at this point, for, for project one, you won't have to. Um, okay, I will get back to you. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So, um, all right, we have our, our rough query plan here. And now we'd like to be able to estimate how much it's going to cost. So let's start with the, the simplest possible approach here. Um, we have no index built on any of this, so we have to do a full table scan. Um, and let's try and compute the cost of doing that. 
Now, typically, you're going to keep around some, uh, some level of statistics uh, about your, your tables. So for the officer's table, we might be keeping your own statistics like uh, every tuple takes a, around 50 bytes, um, there are about 80 tuples per page, and there are 500 pages in total. Uh, so given those statistics, how, what would the cost of a file scan be in terms of number of IOs? 500. Excellent. Um, okay. So, we have to do 500 IOs for the, uh, for the file scan. Now, after the next step, depending on how we're going... So now, we have to figure out how we're going to implement this aggregate. Let's say we do it by using the sort method. If we're going to do that, we're going to have to use uh, an external sort at this point, because 500 pages might not fit in memory. So in order to do that, we're going to have to uh, first write out all the tuples. So if we do, as we're doing our, our, our file scan, we can perform a selection, a projection, and uh, then we can write out those tuples to disk as we get them. Um, any thoughts on what the cost of that would be? So how many pages of output would we be getting? Or how, how many pages would we have to write, first off? 500? Okay. So if we wrote out every single thing that we got, we'd have to write out 500 uh, pages worth of data. Are we, uh, are we outputting every single thing that we get? No. Excellent. So, in short, it's going to be less than 500 IOs, and it's going to de depend on what these two operators end up doing. Now, in databases, we have a fun little term for this. We have what's known as a reduction factor. A reduction factor is basically a way of uh, sort of quantifying how much data gets uh, discarded by a projection or a selection operator. Um, so a selection operator can discard tuples, a projection operator can discard columns, and each of these are going to reduce the, the total space, the total volume that uh, it takes up. So, yes? Um, so are we writing only one page at a time? Um, depends. So, uh, yes, you are correct. Um, so, for our purposes here, what we're going to um, you're right. Um, the general assumption is uh, about this. So, we're uh, what I'm describing to you is uh, the general process used by what's known as the system R optimizer. It's pretty much the, the optimizer that, that started it all. Um, and it's more or less the basis for what people have been using uh, for a very long time. Um, it makes a couple of simplifying assumptions, namely that there is... that I won't say that um, it assumes that there is no difference between scans and uh, writes, uh, sorry, scans and, and random reads, but it does make a simplifying assumption that if one operation is going to require random reads, um, all of the other strategies for implementing that particular thing are going to require random reads as well. Um, in short, the, the two metrics that it uses are total number of IOs and total number of um, uh, sorry, to, uh, it uses a couple of various tricks to sort of uh, quantify the amount of processing cost as well. Um, there are definitely ways of improving that, and practically speaking, you would probably want to do so. But um, there's sort of a trade off in how much time you spend optimizing the query, how much information, and how much time you spend actually. Uh, processing the query. And for an interactive C system like what SQL is typically aimed at, you usually want to spend a little bit, you're willing to accept some error uh, in, in the cost of processing. Sorry, in the cost of, you're willing to accept a, a somewhat suboptimal plan 
in exchange for uh, the, the query compiling a bit faster. Does that make sense? So we, uh, we assume that we are writing one uh, Basically, yes. Um, note that there is a... So uh, keep in mind that basically anything I say uh, for the course of the class um, or for the course of this class is going to assume that we're writing, we're doing random writes. Um, but it's possible to essentially, uh, using some fairly minor tweaks, uh, to readjust the costs for um, for scans as well. So um, basically, everywhere you see IOs, you can sort of uh, determine whether or not the IOs are based on the operator that produces those IOs, you can figure out whether the IOs are going to be sequential or not and adjust the co cost accordingly. So I guess another way of looking at it is that I'm presenting a simplified form of uh, a simplified optimization strategy that you can make more complex um, if it's meaningful to do so. Um, there's nothing... Essentially, I'm, I'm providing sort of a very high-level general strategy for, for computing this. Uh, computing the cost. And the, if you're interested in, uh, in sort of the next step, uh, and it's unclear how, what form that next step takes, then I'd be glad to talk about it offline. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so essentially the uh, Right. The, the main point that I'm trying to get across here is that we need some way of representing how uh, effective a particular uh, operator is at reducing the number of tuples in a relation. Um, and this is represented by what's known as the reduction factor. And although the name is a little bit misleading, uh, this basically represents the how many, uh, what fraction of the data uh, is still present in the output? So if I were to say that there is a reduction factor of 0 0.75 as a consequence of this selection and projection, what that means is that 75% of the tuples make it through that selection predicate or that projection predicate. In other words, we end up with not 500, but in this case, 375 IOs. Okay, so we can actually combine that first write with the external sort algorithm that I talked about uh, about a week or two ago. Um, for 500 IOs, if we have a buffer size of 50 frames, we're going to need uh, a total of how many passes using external sort? So in the, the naive external sort, uh, how how Two passes. Why? Log base 50 of 375. Uh, so two passes. We do a right. Uh, so we, we can combine that external sort with the, the right. That gets us the first pass. Um, and if... So hypothetically, how many um, IOs would be required for two full passes of external sort? External merge sort? 375 times for two full passes. Just uh, nothing's in mem nothing's available at all uh, when when it uh, when we so external merge sort takes uh, there we need two passes of external merge sort. Um, each pass has to do what? Uh, it has to read in everything and then sort it and then uh, read in everything in small chunks. Sort those small chunks write them to disk, which takes two, uh, so twice the number of IOs. Um, okay, what about, uh, what should we call it? Okay, so we have to do uh, two passes, and each pass takes twice the number of IOs uh, that are required to, to read in everything and write it back, or, well, read in everything or write it back out. So hypothetically, that would mean uh, 750 IOs. 
sorry, uh, times two, 1,500 uh, 15, 15, IOs. Um, on the other hand, we can actually combine the first phase with this. So the first phase is essentially performed by this. In the second phase, we can actually combine, uh, we, we can uh, read things out, and we can combine that with the aggregation operator. So we end up only having to do 375 IOs in order to finish the sort. Um, so what about so what about uh, performing the aggregate on that that's uh, list uh, on that sorted data? So well, this is a three set. Okay, so this is actually uh, I'm lying a little bit here. Um, we can combine the sort with uh, actually this. Uh, so hypothetically, performing the last phase of, of the sort would require uh, 750 IOs. Uh, but rather than writing the output of the sort to disk and then reading it back, we can actually perform, uh, perform the aggregation at the same time that we perform that last phase of the sort. So uh, we can actually not just reduce the cost of the sort, but also reduce the cost of, cost of reading the result back out uh, from the aggregate. So in other words, uh, this whole operation takes a grand total of uh, 1,250 IOs. Um, and that's for using a strategy that involves no indices and the sorted group by aggregate. So any questions on this? OK. So there's this, uh, this strange reduction factor that I kind of gave you. Um, just out of thin air here. Uh, one of the main challenges of uh, cost estimation is also estimating reduction factors. So we are going to talk now about how do we estimate those reduction factors. Now, something I'd like to note is that the reduction factors apply equivalently both to uh, the number of pages uh, both to I.O. costs and compute costs. Um, the number I.O. costs are typically <coughs> expressed in terms of number of pages, while compute costs are typically going to be expressed in number of tuples. Um, that's sort of, again, it's a very broad, uh, very overgeneralized way of representing these costs. Um, but as it turns out, it's, all, it's usually sufficient for most things. So, <clears throat> for projection, it's usually fairly obvious. The, the number, you have some estimate for how big a particular row is. Um, you have to compute essentially how, much, uh, how many columns the projection operator projects away. For a selection operator, that's a little more complex because you can potentially have multiple different terms in the selection operator. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the selection operator and transform it into conjunctive normal form. What that means is essentially it's going to be a conjunction of disjunctions. In other words, um, a bunch of uh, clauses where each clause is A or B or C or D. And then we're going to compute the, the uh, end of all of the clauses. So since we have a bunch of clauses, A1 through AN, and we're conjuncting them together, uh, recall that this selection predicate is equivalent to that uh, series of selections. So we can split those apart and have uh, essentially a series of these uh, disjunctions. Now, uh, thinking back to uh, Boolean logic and uh, all sorts of stuff you probably haven't touched in ages, um, there is a law uh, a logic law that is typically referred to as De Morgan's law that says uh, if you have the disjunction of a series of terms, that's equivalent to uh, the negation of the conjunction of the negation of those terms. And <coughs> estimating the, uh, the reduction factor of a negated clause is essentially uh, you're, you're computing uh, the inverse of... So if, uh, if a particular clause uh, reduces you to 75% uh, of, of the tuples, then 
the inverted clause is going to reduce you to 25% of your tuples. So essentially, one minus the reduction factor. Uh, so you can compute the, the total reduction factor of a disjunction of terms uh, in, in pretty much the same way. Uh, so essentially, what, what I'm trying to get to is a point where all we're interested in is computing the reduction factor of an individual atom uh, without, con uh, without being concerned for uh, negations or any sort of Boolean logic operator. Is that... Uh, is that understandable? Uh, speak up, please. So if a reduction factor is 1, then that means that all of the tuples pass through the selection predicate. Uh, that's essentially equivalent to a selection predicate of true. And a reduction, uh, correspondingly, a reduction factor of 0 would be equivalent to uh, the predicate false. Okay. Any questions on this? Great. Okay, so essentially we've gotten to the point where we're, if we can compute the reduction factor of individual atoms, uh, and by atom I mean uh, just a simple comparison operator, uh, we can compute the reduction factor of a much more complex query. So how do we compute the reduction factor of a predicate like a equals 1. Well, there, we're going to have to make certain assumptions about the data. Um, if the data... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> we have to make certain assumptions about the data. Um, in particular, we have, to make a, we have to be able to guess how many of the tuples are going to match that particular predicate. Now, that's a tricky thing to ask, because if we knew all of that data, if we knew all of the information about that data, then we wouldn't have to run the query. Um, so what we end up doing in practice is keeping track of a couple of different things. Um, usually either the range of values that this uh, variable A can take, um, or possibly the number of distinct values that it can take. And if you have a range, you can usually estimate how many distinct possible values live in that range. And similarly, if you have... Um, well, if you have the number of distinct values that there could be, you can sort of assume that each of them has uh, an equivalent number of, of values with that particular key. And what do I mean by that? Um, let's say that A can take values from 0 to 100. And as a simplifying assumption, what we end up doing is essentially assuming that there are an equivalent number of tuples uh, with a value of a equal to 1, equal to 2, equal to 3, equal to 4, and so forth, all the way up to 100, which means there's 100 different possible values of a. And so what we assume, essentially, is that this predicate is going to return 1 one-hundredth of the data set. Is that clear? OK. So what if I were to use an in clause here, where a is in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10? Hmm? OK, so there are 10 possible keys that satisfy the, the predicate. Uh, so uh, and 100 different possible keys, so 10 over 100 uh, is 1 tenth. Uh, so that thing would have a reduction factor of 1 in 10. Exactly. 10. OK, what about if there was an inequality here? We're looking for r dot a is greater than, let's say, 50. Hmm? And by 2, how'd you get that? Yeah. So. Uh, if, there, if keys fall in the range uh, 50 to 100, again, if we assume that there's an equivalent number of keys uh, for each value, then what we end up with uh, is essentially almost identical to that. We consider every single key that is greater than 100. Uh, so, well, loosely speaking, we have some uh, high value and some low value. Uh, we compute the fraction of that space 
that is um, that satisfies the predicate. Okay, what about so I've I've been talking about um, constant values here. What if we don't have constant uh, a constant value? What if we're comparing um, let's say r dot a with s dot b? Uh, no, no, uh, uh, just one atom. R dot A equals S dot B. So the... Select um, star from R and S, where R dot A equals S dot B. How would we... Take the common range of R, A, and B. OK, so we can... Well, there's actually a number of different possibilities here. Um, but yeah, OK, so we can figure out what the, the common range of, of the two is, and then... Okay, so find the number of possible pairings and then count how many of those are, are equivalent. That is in the numerator. Okay, um, so actually what ends up happening is uh, something... So you can do all sorts of, of things here. Um, what actually ends up happening is something that provides a nearly equivalent uh, version of that. Um, what we do is uh, count the number of keys uh, that appear in A and the number of keys that appear in B. And essentially the reduction factor uh, is going to be uh, the, the better of the two. Um, it's not quite the same thing, but it gets you a nearly equivalent result. And it's computationally simpler. Which is, again, important when you're trying to optimize a, a query plan. Uh, in, optimize uh, a query that's been requested interactively. And again, you can do much more complex uh, things like count the uh, range. Um, the other thing is you can also treat this as sort of a uh, nested loop scan. So for every, um, for every tuple, in, loosely speaking, for every tuple in, let's say, A, it's going to have to get matched up against one tuple in B. So in other words, there's, uh, you're, you're doing a constant number of lookups on uh, one of the two relations. Or sorry, you're doing a number of constant lookups on one of the two relations. OK, so any questions up to this point? OK, let's see this in action. So let's say we have two indices. Um, and let's say that for the sake of argument, they are both tree indices. And furthermore, for the sake of argument, let's say that the uh, index pages for those tree indices are all already in memory. So let's start off with the two indices that are available, um, o.age and o.rank. Now we have uh, potentially a number of additional statistics about this officer table. Now that we're building these indices over age and rank, we need to keep track of um, sort of the, the number of a number of additional features, namely the number of distinct ranks and the number of distinct ages. In terms of ranks, well, let's say that there are eleven distinct ranks, and we explicitly name each of them, so we keep track of that. Let's say we also keep track of the range of possible ages. We don't necessarily have uh, any individual uh, at every single age in between fifteen and one hundred, but Let's say that we have uh, all of the, the ages fall into that particular range. So now, um, the, the question we have to ask is, what is the reduction factor? So now the question we're trying to ask is, what is the cost of an index scan? And if we have these two indices, how do we get the cost of the index scan? So does the index scan scan through the entire relation? No. So we don't have to scan through those full 500 pages. 
Uh, if we have a index on age, what is, let's say, what that, what is the um, cost going to be? We're in terms of number of IOs. The number of pages we need to scan in. How, how do we get that? So the number of ages that fall in this particular range. Exactly. And how do we get that? Uh, did I hear? Reduction factor. Thank you. Um, exactly. So um, that essentially corresponds precisely to this reduction factor business. Um, so we can estimate the cost of the index scan uh, if we know what the reduction factor is. So, uh, what is the reduction factor of um, this particular predicate on O dot H? Two by thirty. Sorry. Two by thirty. How, how did or how did you get that? Ten by ten divided by eighty-five. Um, essentially, yeah. So there are actually nine different values that satisfy that, but not going to quibble. Um, essentially, yes. So what you do is there. Uh, Technically nine, but let's say for rounding purposes, ten different values that satisfy that. Uh, sorry, ten different keys um, in that particular range. If age is an integer, and there are eighty-five different possible uh, keys overall. So using our uniform assumption, um, then there are ten divided by eighty-five different keys that will satisfy this particular predicate, um, or about one in eight point five. How about rake? Sorry? Well, uh, in increments of 0 0.5, so 11, but yeah, uh, basically. Um, so, in short, there are. Uh, how are we doing on time? We are running out of time, so let me. Um, so, in short, there are about uh, 10. Uh, the reduction factor on age is about 0.1. Um, and the reduction factor on rank is about 0 0.5. So if we assume that the projection is going to uh, add another reduction factor of 0 0.8, that ends up giving us uh, a total of 23 IOs for the second phase. And because that actually fits in our, our buffer size of 50 frames, we end up having to pay only 53 IOs for the full index scan. Um, now, actually, sorry, I'm skipping one thing. Uh, which of these is the better index to perform to use? So, if this has an index, uh, if if this has a reduction factor of um, 0 0.1 and this has a reduction factor of 0 0.5, which do we want to use? 0 0.5 is going to give us how many tuples? Or uh, yeah, so 0 0.1. That means 10% of the tuples make it through here. 50% of the tuples make it through here. So we end up with a uh, using the, the age index. OK. Um, so to summarize, oh, eh, OK. Uh, to summarize, we have this whole space of possible uh, search uh, queries. Um, so we want to be able to consider the cost of each plan, um, and we'll talk about join order uh, and various other strategies in the next uh, class or two. So.